whole of mathematics as we know it today began from the simple act of counting. Through seeing various patterns in nature, we have developed the capacity to count using numbers. These numbers now lie at the very core of our mathematical understanding. With time, we have defined various mathematical operations of numbers like addition, subtraction, multiplication, divisions, etc. Today, we'll start by employing these fundamental operations to introduce an observation, then delve deeply into understanding these observations and finally get to the reasoning behind it. So for this observation, let's take a random natural number, say the number 5. Now we divide this number into equal parts, like we can divide the number 5 in 2 equal parts of 5 halves, in 3 equal parts of 5 thirds, in 4 equal parts of 5 fourths, in 5 equal parts of 1s, and in 6 equal parts of 5 sixths, and so on. Now after dividing 5 in these different ways, uh, let's multiply these equal parts to get their product. Uh, say that this yellow rectangle represents the multiplication operations so we can get the product of all these parts here from just a simple observation we can see that those two equal parts of five halves have the maximum product similarly again let's repeat the process for the number 17. first we divide 17 into equal parts of two equal parts of three equal parts of four equal parts of five equal parts of six and let's say equal parts of 7 and equal parts of 8 as well. We can go on and on but let's stop here. And then we use the same method and multiply all the respective equal parts to get their respective products. This time the interesting thing is those 6 equal parts of 17 now have the maximum product. So till now we have found out that the product of equal parts of number 5 is maximum when we have a total of two equal parts of five and the product of equal parts of number 17 is maximum when we have a total of six equal parts of 17. For me now the question that comes to my mind is um, can we find a way to predict when the product of equal parts will become maximum without even calculating the product. So can there be something like that? Let's find out. So to understand this process let's try and generalize it. Say that we have a natural number a and let's say that we divide the number a into u equal parts and also that there are n total parts meaning n times u is a that is if there are n number of u's and we add them together we get a that is also we can say u plus u plus u n times yields a. Simplifying this we can observe that u is actually equal to a over n which means if there are n total parts of a number a, then each part would be equal to a over n. Now we can substitute the value of u in our previous equation and from this we get that a actually equals to the sum of a over n n times. This was our first step in the process previously. After this, we actually went on to multiply each part to get their product. Let's do the same here. Let's denote the variable z as a result of multiplying a over n by itself n times, representing the repeated indivisible part, which could be neatly written as z is equals to a over n raised to the power n. Now if you observe this formula, we get to see that the value of z is solely dependent upon the value of n, because a is just a constant natural number that we choose. So we can say that z is actually a function of n. So after playing around with the numbers 5 and 17, we got curious. When does the product reach its peak? In other words, how many slices do we need to split our number, the individual number A, into to get the biggest Z possible, to get the biggest product possible? In mathematical terms, we are basically asking what's the magic number N that makes Z as big as it can get. At this point, we want to identify the maxima of our function and we'll be employing tools of calculus to guide us. But before we dive into the specifics of our problem, let's take a moment to revisit the fundamentals of how this approach works. So let's take a function, say minus x plus 3 whole squared plus 4 and let's plot this function in our coordinate plane. Now recall that the derivative of a function at a chosen point is actually the slope of the tangent line to the graph of the function at that specific point. Examining our graph, 
we notice that the shape of our function's curve resembles a downward curve. That is, it's, it's a sort of a concave downward curve. This suggests that within our range, there's definitely going to be a high point, that is a maximum value. As we slide our tangent line along the curve, something intriguing happens when we hit that maximum spot. You can see that the slope of our tangent line level offs at zero. Aha, that's it. Identifying the point where the derivative hits zero for a downward curving function guides us straight to the maximum. Technically, it could be a local or absolute maximum, but upon analyzing this graph, it seems like the absolute maximum is here. And the maximum of the function in this graph actually occurred at x is equals to minus three. So now with those principles in mind, now let's apply them to our specific problem. We know that our problem was to find the value of n at which the value of the function z is maximized. But even before that, our main problem was actually to find how many slices do we need to split our number into to get the maximum product possible. Which means we're actually interested in the positive integer which gives us the maximum value of z. So to move forward on that, let's graph our function and see its characteristics. Since there is a constant a, let's assume that a equals to a value from 5 to 8 and plot them accordingly here. From the graph, it is pretty clear that the function has a maximum value and for a different values of a, the maximum also changes. Since it is clear that the function has a maximum value, we can now start differentiating the function z with respect to n. Before starting, we can see that a over n is raised to the power of n. So let's apply natural log on both sides of the equation so that we can use the power rule for logarithms to bring down the power. After applying that, now let's apply the differential operator on both sides of the equation. Now, to differentiate both sides with respect to n, we'll use the chain rule. So let's continue. On the left hand side of the equation, we first employ the implicit differentiation to simplify the term, while on the right hand side, we can utilize the product rule for simplification. By simplifying the expression further, we can get the expression on the right hand side to be further simplified. And then when we multiply both sides by z, we find that the derivative of the function z with respect to n is actually natural log of a over n minus 1 times z. Having calculated the derivative of the function with respect to z, we now determine the slope of the tangent line at any point of the curve. Since we aim to find the point n at which the functional value is maximum, we set the derivative to 0. In other words, the slope of the tangent line at point n is 0. For this condition to hold, natural log of a over n minus 1 must equal 0. Given that the product of two terms is 0 if one of the term is 0, but since z cannot be 0, natural log of a over n minus 1 must be equal to 0. This implies that natural log of a over n equals 1. The natural logarithm of any function equals 1 if and only if the input of the function is Euler constant e. Thus, this implies that a over n equals e. Therefore, our required value of n is a over e. We can also visualize this in a plot. Let's graph those same curves we plotted earlier. Alongside that, if we now also plot the graph of e to the power n, all the maximum values actually lie on its curve. This actually shows that e to the power n gives the maximum value of product of those equal parts of the number where n will be equals to a by e. So we have found out that the value of n should be equal to a over e to maximize the function. If we look back again, our main question was, can we find a way to predict when the product of equal parts of a number becomes maximum without calculating the product? Now, let's see what we found. We defined a to be equal to the sum of a over n total n times. And now, if we substitute the value of n in the given expression, we get a to be equal to the sum of n Euler constants. But this is only possible if and only if a is an integer multiple of e. And this is not the case here. Now, if you want to find the positive integer, which gives us the maximum value of j, we can say that one of either integers closest to a by e will always give the maximum. So let's test our answer. Let's take the number 17. What should each equal part be to maximize their product? It should be 17 over e from our calculations. But 17 over e is not an integer. 
So let's check the two integers closest to 17 over e. The integer that is closest to 17 over e is 6, which is actually the answer we found out during our calculations earlier. So from this, we have found out that if you are dividing a natural number into equal parts, the closer the part to e, the higher the product becomes. And in such a division, where the part becomes the closest to e, their product will be the maximum among all integer partitions.